one of the things that I do is uh, I go around and I do conferences and I teach believers how to be the church outside of the four walls of the church. Uh, I just have never really specialized in what goes on in here. I tried to do it that way for some time. And I just tell people, look, whatever you're doing Sunday morning, enjoy it. <laughs> enjoy God and, do, and be really good at it. Let's just don't call that church. Let's call that the celebration of the church. But what you do during the week when you leave the building and how, how we uh, are, that is the expression of the church. Uh, that, that's a huge deal. Uh, and if I had to trade off between the two, man, I would take the unorganized, disassembled stuff, uh, but let's see it happen. And let's see the body of Christ express itself out in the world, uh, doing the dirty work up to our elbows in junk, you know, uh, so that we can see the kingdom of God touch the lost, the last, the least, the forgotten, the hurting, the broken, that that's what God's all about. And that as people get restored and, and, and get connected with God, he not, Jesus not only breaks down the barriers that we have between us and God, He breaks away the barriers that we have amongst one another. So God is called our Father. And so as soon as we're born again, guess what? We're born into a family. And, but what I experience very often is that, unfortunately, you can take aspects of family, you can make it into a program and mechanicalize it, and it ends up like an orphanage, you know? You've got a mom, you got a house mom and a house dad, you know? And you've got beds, you've got brothers and sisters, you get three meals, you get an education, but there's a heck of a lot of a difference between having all of the forms and the functions of what a family is and having a real family, you know? And so oftentimes what we've done is we've gone back to the New Testament and we look for principles and, 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 and activities and we end up incorporating that into a program without relationships, without reality, without real connection and life change. Uh, and it turns into something altogether different. And so you end up with a lot of children coming Sunday after Sunday and maybe Wednesday night and they, they have their Christian life as a series of disconnected relationships and their real connection is only with a building at a certain time because you know and, and but a lot of church life what I've discovered is that when there's real spiritual life it's happening but it's usually happening around what I was structuring <laughs> it was happening in spite of what I was trying to accomplish instead of what I was trying to program uh, into uh, so I've been a pastor, I've been a church planter, I've been a missionary, and I decided to give up my ministry. <laughs> And because my ministry sucked. <laughs> I, but I didn't give it up because I decided the Lord said, Hey, how about you stop doing your ministry? And how about you start let, letting me do mine? Amen? Yeah. This is the ministry of Jesus. And so I spent a lot of time talking Christians out of your Christian life and out of your ministry. Um, because guess what? Your Christian life sucks. But Jesus really is able to live the Christian life in you, as you, and through you. And so what I want to maybe talk about for the time, short time that we have together are some of the things that, that God has recovered in my life that I believe that are essential for the church to recover. Because how many of you know, you kind of step into things, and some of us grew up in church our whole life, and we're like, this is, you know, so we read the word church, and we think, you know what, we've always experienced, you know, but if I told... If I told my son, hey, you know, hey, let's play some football today. You know, if we grew up in Brazil, he's going to go downstairs in the basement, get a round ball with little black and white dots. But if we grew, but growing up in America, he's going to get a, a brown oblong ball with white laces, right? So depend. So sometimes the context of what you've always experienced determines what you what you think about, what you picture in your mind when you read certain things. So we read elders, pastors, uh, deacons, and we think of those people that are running the organization. Come on. <laughs> Right? 
But that is not what was going on. So I want to talk about kind of some some basic things that need to be recovered. And I'm going to open up the can of worms and see if I can't, you know, uh, make this a little bit better. So uh, recently I was in uh, Africa and Kenya, and one of the things that I did there, I feel uh, an obligation to the rest of the world because we not only exported the gospel, we exported our limitations. <laughs> we exported the box that we put the gospel into. And so we exported churchianity as well as, as the gospel of Jesus. And so I feel an obligation to the rest of the world. When I go overseas, I, I'm very, very frank. You know, I recognize that whenever you go somewhere, you're building on somebody else's foundation. Amen. So you don't just come in and just create a mess and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, when I, when, uh, but in Africa, they're really looking to you for a lot of leadership. So I said, look, here's the deal. As soon as, and we're doing a church leadership conference, I said, as soon as you guys start showing character and start showing giftedness and start showing some faithfulness, guess what? They, they pull you out of what you've been doing and they put you into a seminary and they teach you how to be a clergyman that can start and lead congregations. But let me tell you, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus had people who would live with Him. He would take them under His wings. And He would teach them to walk in the power and the authority of the kingdom so that they could make disciples. And what you've been taught is that the way to make disciples as a clergyman is by starting and leading congregations. But I tell you, if you've got a real heart for disciple making, one of the things that you find is that with your limited time, that, that actually what you're doing in starting and leading congregations is actually inhibiting and keeping you and distracting you from making disciples. And I said, listen, I'm not telling you to stop doing anything that you're doing. You know, you know, keep preaching the sermons, keep preaching the Word, keep worshiping the Lord. But we've got to recover some things. Amen? Well, you've got to get out from behind your pulpit. How many of you could have learned possibly to play basketball or play football or play any sort of sport and you know, you go to the first practice, you've never played it before, you've seen it on TV, and the coach sits you down in the bleachers and he lectures you about teamwork. And then you come back for the next one and he tells you, and he, and he gives you a great lecture about dribbling and passing methodologies. And then the next time he comes in and he tells you how to, he gives you a lecture about playing defense, you know, and, and then the next one is here's some plays, you know, so that you can score. And, you know, and then he gives you the last one. He gives you a great motivational speech about hustling, right? And then you go play your first game. Everybody's out of shape. Nobody's touched a ball. Nobody's ever done a thing. And, you know, and you get out there and you just get slaughtered. And guess what? You come back to the next practice thinking, well, maybe the coach has figured this out. No, the coach sits the team back in the bleacher and says, let's go over this again. And now I'm starting to wonder about your commitment. You know, I've told you this over and over and over again. And I see you passing notes. I see you nodding off in the bleachers, you know. I ask you to get ready and set aside some extra time for some extra practices so you could come and listen to me teach some more. Ain't nobody coming. You know, and, and, and when we think that the problem's with us, and the problem is not with us. Everybody's heart, I believe nobody's waking up in the morning saying, hey, how can I screw up the church? <laughs> how can I live a sucky Christian life? Nobody's doing that. The problem is, is that there was a matrix that was created that we were shoved into something that's not kingdom. We were shoved into paganity. Come and, and we got to find some way that there's some man standing between you and God and the unwashed masses. And now, you know, we got this holy place we got to come into. Jesus did away with all of that. Religion works by holy men doing holy things in holy places for unholy people. 
And, and that's how religion works. But Jesus said, we had that in the Old Testament. It doesn't work. That's not God's plan. We're getting it all out of the way. And guess what? Now you're my holy place. You're my holy people. You, Everything you do is a holy thing. Amen? And everywhere you go, God is with you. God is in you. God is for you. And so if you see something that God... That, that doesn't look like God, go and manifest. Let God, because that's God's plan. God, you know, so many times we as even charismatic believers, sometimes Bible-believing believers, we're still calling for the presence of God to come out of heaven instead of believing for the presence of God to flow out from us. Amen? And so we're waiting to feel tingles or have some gold dust to give us a little bit of affirmation instead of saying, holy smokes, I've got the fire of God living in me. So when I pray let your spirit flow, God pour out your spirit. I'm thinking from here to them. Amen. Let it come out. Let the power of God come out. And so that one of the things that we need to recover is authentic disciple making. Authentic disciple making. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, towards the end of that, Paul says, I'm sending to you Timothy, who will remind you of my ways which are in Christ Jesus. And just before that, he said, you don't have many fathers. You've got many instructors. Amen? And then he said, but be imitators of me as I also follow Christ. Right? So do you see a whole culture here that I believe in the sufficiency of the Word of God. It's able to equip us in all manner of righteousness. Right? So that the man of God can be fully equipped. But one of the things that the Word of God teaches us is it points to the fact that God doesn't like to be just a theoretical God. He likes for to send Timothys who who will who who got the word in their hand, but then their li- the word is living in them, so that people can see the ways. You've got the words and the music. You've got the words and the picture that goes with the words. Amen? So that locks it in, into people's minds and into their experience. And, you know, we have many instructors in the body of Christ. What's the difference between an instructor and a father? A father instructs. Amen? One of the things that's a difference is is that the father has relationship. Amen? Amen? The Father has love. My instructors in college, they didn't love me. They loved their paychecks. Amen? (laughs) And that's the difference between a lot of leadership in the body of Christ. And so, uh, instructors, you only see them in their classrooms. A Father, they live with you. They're in the grind with you. A Father takes responsibility for their children. Amen? Amen? And so one of the things that that you might realize is that children don't get it, but you don't beat your children up for not getting it, do you? You Your heart is turned towards them so that all of the strength and the wisdom that you have, you you use that instead of to judge them and then beat them down. You use what you've got and you, and you connect with them at a heart-to-heart relationship so that you can pour in what you've got to build them up. So everything you see that they don't have, if they don't have it, well, whose job is it to give it to them? And so instead of judging them for not being committed, you don't set them back and say, hey, okay, we're going to lecture you again. You get involved in their lives. You walk alongside them and you build them up. That's what Jesus did in Mark chapter 3, I believe it says, that He appointed the twelve to be with them so that He might send them out and give them the authority to heal the sick, to cast out demons and preach the kingdom. Do you know there's something about the reason that a lot of people don't walk in the authority and who we have in, uh, what we have in Christ. They've been told it, but they've never been with somebody that's walking in it. Yeah. Amen? You can believe, I know I should have it. Well, I know we need it. That don't work. <laughs> It'll motivate you to keep looking. But eventually, you've got to find somebody who's got it or, or be willing to learn by your mistakes. Amen? And that's one of the things we, we in the lecture format that we have adopted... 
There's nothing wrong with preaching the Word. Don't get me wrong. I'm trying to add to that. Not subtract from it. It's what we can't let that be all of ministry. I went to seminary and I came out of seminary a well equipped clergyman who was very ineffective. <laughs> okay? And I had to learn, I had to go back to the drawing board and say, what is it that we're missing? And a lot of what we were missing was a method of ministry that Jesus used of walking alongside of people, of show them how. So one of the things that I do is whenever we do a conference, I'll do a conference and I'll teach them the Word to help uh, you know, get that involved. But then we coach them, say, okay, now we're going to do it. Now it's activation time. Okay, and we walk them through the process. Now this is what I want you to do. Good. What did you experience? Great. And how many healings did we have? And there's always hands that go up. Cool. How many of you didn't get healed? There's a few hands that go up. Great. All right. Now here's, guess what you do now? You do it again. Amen. Because you don't change what you believe until, because you didn't see the results and say, okay, well, God must not want them healed. So I would say that the other essential thing that we've got to get We've got to get this, okay? Is that we have got to get Christ-centered again. We've got to get Christ-centered again. Um, And this goes into a whole lot of different things. The New Testament church was not trying to be like the New Testament church. They weren't, they weren't imitating principles. They had received the revelation and the impartation of life because the fullness of God was in this man. That everything that they needed uh, from God or for themselves or about themselves was in Christ. And now He's in me. So you are not a have-not amongst a bunch of haves. Everything in all of the Scriptures bear witness of Him. Our problem is is that we've got so many Bible verses, you know you can put those together and make just about any kind of screwball theology you want. Amen? And so after a while, people are like, well, which one's right? And they just start looking for something that looks familiar. You know, this is what I grew up in. Jesus is the Word made flesh. Amen? Amen? I tell people, I say, Bible verses are like puzzle pieces or Lego pieces. You can make a lot of different things out of those things depending on how you put them together. But at the end of the day, you need to look at the cover on the box. And if it doesn't look like what Jesus showed us, what Jesus demonstrated, uh, who His Father was. He said, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. Amen? How many people did Jesus go around leaving sick, making sick, saying, hey, I'm going to teach you a spiritual lesson by your sickness? How many demon-possessed people came, were brought to Jesus and Jesus say, well, what did you do and what do you need to repent of so that I can cast it out of you? Uh-huh. How many people did Jesus say, oh, you know, I'd like to get you set free, but I'm sorry, you're under a generational curse. Your grandfather was a 32nd degree mason. You're screwed. <laughs> No. How many people did he say, you know what, Gadarene demoniac, you got a legion of demons in there. Man, I ain't got time for all this. We're going to have to go back to every one of those formative experiences that allowed a demon entryway. And we got to figure out all these doors you opened. And we got to close all these doors. Jesus didn't do it that way. He didn't. But how much of, of our churchianity is just by people taking Bible verses, putting them together so that they can make a fancy teaching in a book. So that, hey, I've never heard that before. You know there's a reason you ain't never heard it before because you had to get somebody using their imagination putting Bible verses together in a way that nobody's ever thought of before, including Jesus. But Jesus will straighten all that stuff out. And so I found that the, 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 the more I just focus on Him, that He is my Christian life, that He is the authority that I walk in, He is the power that I walk in, He is the anointing that I walk in, and that everything that He does, He can do through me and He can do through every believer. And our job is not just to tell people that, but to take them out and go do it with you. So one of the things I love to do is take people out. Just last week, I've got a, we got a little life team that I do locally, but a lot of stuff I do is out. But 
people say, well, oh, you did that because you were in Kenya. No, no, no. I, we took a, we, we, our life team went out to the mall, and, and so there was a group of three people coming, and I said, hey, you guys want to see something cool? And uh, they said, sure. I said, so which of you have something that gives you pain, like an injury that didn't heal or something like that? And they all looked at this one who had, was complaining of, of shoulder issues and neck issues. And I said, oh, that's really cool because God uses my friend here for miracles. <laughs> because that's part of disciple making, amen? You do the hard stuff, like talking to strangers and approaching people. You teach them them, but then you give them the experience, right? You make it possible for them to borrow your courage until they get their own. Amen? Amen. Take them some courage. Give Brother Andy a hand. Great job, man. Awesome.